right now, just put your hands together. Let's just thank God for his presence today. He has not left us. He has not forsaken us. He is here today. He is in your living room. He is with you, and he is for you. Today, we're beginning a brand new uh, series of talks called God is My Help. How many of you are grateful today that God is our help? He's our ever-present help in time of need. The inspiration for this series comes out of my personal time with God as I've been processing and praying about this season for our region and this season for our church. And I really felt like God was uh, telling me to tell you, uh, I'm just not your hope. I am your hope. I am also your help. I'm not just your hope in your future, I'm your help right now. And in this series, we are going to look at how very practically God is our help. I've been in the book of Psalms quite a bit over the last six weeks. And Psalm 125 is a very reassuring text because it talks about how God surrounds his people. It says those who trust in God are like Zion Mountain. Nothing can move it. A rock-solid mountain you can always depend on. Mountains encircle Jerusalem. God encircles his people. He always has and he always will. You see, God is our hope, but he's also our help. And I'm so excited about getting into God's word today. I'm going to pray Uh, that as we open his word, that our hearts would be open. You see, so often when we get into God's word, our, our heart's posture has a lot to do with what we will or will not receive. Our heart's posture will actually do a lot to what we see when we study. So let's pray that we have proper heart posture today. Let's open our minds and open our hearts to the all the potential that God has for us. Would you pray with me? Uh, Heavenly Father, we open our hearts to you today. Would you speak to us as we open your word? We want to lean in on this idea that you are our help. God, help us to hear from you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. I've only ever quit one thing in my entire life. And that's junior high football. I quit. I straight up walked off the field. I had just recently moved to a small town in Tennessee. And as a sixth grader, by way of just trying to meet new people, I went out for football. And I got through about midseason. And the team was doing pretty good. But I'll never forget midseason, during the midweek, we were having what they would call a hit day. Every football player knows that at some point in the week for football, there are hit days. And I remember that being a hit day, and it felt like every hit drill was centered up on me. Come on, maybe you felt that way before. I just, I was getting my bell rung time after time, and that's when it happened. I I was so, like, disillusioned and overwhelmed with all the hits midseason that I took my helmet off. And I walked off the field. It's probably one of the most disappointing moments in my life. I mean, I quit. I took off my helmet and I quit. And I know that the reality is that some of you right now, you feel like you're mid-season. Because of the situation and circumstance that we find ourselves in, you feel like you're mid-season and you are keep on taking hit after hit, day after day, and, and, and it's, it's overwhelming you. It, it's, it's got you all disillusioned, and you don't really know what's coming next. And I just wonder today how many of you feel that way. Maybe for you it's not the physical hits. Maybe for you um, it's the emotional toil or the spiritual toil that this is having on you. I mean, here we are in North Idaho, we're going into the sixth week of shelter in place or or stay-at-home order. Uh, Our kids are um, done with school indefinitely this season. 
Our, our seniors aren't going to have the opportunity to graduate. Our restaurants are shut down. Our businesses are shut down. Church doors are closed. Our businesses feel like they're like screeching to a halt. And along with that is our economy. And it just really, it feels like one hit after another. And I know the longer we get into this, I, I was reading that the, the depression rate is, is increasing during this season. Anxiety rate is increasing this season. Um, people who are using pornography, it's like increasing this se- season. Substance abuse is increasing this season. And, and those are all just indicators that people aren't doing well. People are looking for a way to cope. Um, and in essence, what they're doing is they're, they're taking off their helmet and they're finding themselves leaning into things that are unhealthy. And maybe you find yourself in that place. You just don't know how to endure in this time. And I just want to encourage you today. Week one of this series, God is my help. He wants to be your help. So do not quit. Don't take off your helmet and do not walk off the field. But here's the thing. I want to offer you more than motivation today because I remember back when I quit football in my junior high years that my coach that day, although I was being hit, he was still motivating us. He was still motivating me. But because I was getting hit so often, um, the hits had my attention and I, find myself, I found myself discouraged, and his motivation wasn't enough. Sometimes when it's midseason and the hits come one after another, motivation can ring hollow. And so I want to offer you more than motivation today. I want to talk to you and bring to you a message called essential business. Essential business. Because for the Christ follower today, Perseverance is essential business, not just in this season, but in every season. How can we persevere? How can we keep our helmet on? Like, what is it that's going to allow us to stay in the game of life and to persevere in our faith? Well, well, foundationally, let me lay a few things down quickly before we get into some real handles. Foundationally, we've got to understand that perseverance begins with us understanding that because God sticks with us, we can have stick to itiveness. It's because God sticks with us, okay? Every Christ follower, just, just think about it, okay? Logan, think about it in your life. Every Christ follower, If he or she would look in the rearview mirror of their life, what will they find? They will find that God was faithful. In the hardest times, the most discouraging times, the most overwhelming moments, maybe right in the moment it it felt like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but now here they stand alive and able to look back, right? You can see the faithfulness of God in your life as a Christ follower, And so here's what is so important for us to understand. Perseverance is not the result of our determination. It's the result of God's faithfulness. I'm going to say that again so it comes up on your screen. Perseverance is not the result of our determination. It's the result of God's faithfulness. So so it's not about your moxie. It's not about your grit. I think it's a real dangerous thing for Christians to think that perseverance is about their strength and about their grit and about their moxie. You know, perseverance foundationally begins by understanding that it's the result of God's faithfulness and not our faithfulness. So here's the thing. You won't find perseverance by, by probing your current mood. You know, it's like moods. Like, what's your mood? I tell you, my mood was this week. I didn't take a shower for four days. Come on, somebody. If it was, if it was just my mood and persevering, I mean, I wasn't motivated enough, uh, just enough to even shower. And I think that's where a lot of us are. We're like in our pajamas nonstop, and in our mood is like, hey, man, I'm just chilling and binging. That's my mood. And 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 if we allowed our persevering in our faith to follow our mood, it wouldn't go so well. 
But persevering is, is founded in and grounded in first understanding that God is faithful. Listen, uh, you will find perseverance by believing in God's will and purpose and then mapping out his faithfulness in your life. It's being able to look in the rearview mirror of your life and realize that he is faithful. And so we're only able to persevere when you realize, when we realize that God has been faithful, he is being faithful, and he will be faithful. And that's exactly what the, the, the writer of Hebrews was trying to get to a, a group of Hebrew Christians. Today we're going to study just a few verses out of Hebrews chapter 12. And this was a group of Christians who were struggling in their faith. They were struggling and persevering. As a matter of fact, many of them began to complain and many of them began to take off their helmet and say, I I'm not going to do this anymore. How can I believe in a God that will allow bad things to happen? How can I believe in a God who I don't see or, or hear? And so this writer of Hebrews steps in, and if you read back in Hebrews chapter 11, we won't take the time to do it right now, but I want to encourage you this week, sometimes read back in Hebrews chapter 11. It's the hall of faith, Riley. It's unbelievable. Uh, the writer just goes through and systematically, starting from the very beginning of time, and talks about men and women who were faithful to God, who persevered. In their faith. And here's what's very important for us to understand. These were men and women like you and me who have made mistakes, who didn't do it perfectly, but even though they made mistakes and even though they were imperfect, what, what happened? God was faithful to them. And it was because their perspective that God is always faithful that they were able to persevere. So, so we're talking about essential business. And essential business for every believer is perseverance. So how do we persevere? Well, first thing that the Hebrew writer points to in Hebrews chapter 12 is that we've got to have essential relationships. Write that down, all caps, essential relationships. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 1 and 2. Let me read the whole text to you real quickly. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Right off the top, the Hebrew writer says that we, if we're going to persevere, we've got to understand that we have to have essential relationships. If you look back at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, look at what all the we's and the us's, okay? It says, since we since we are surrounded, and then it says, let us lay aside, and then it says, let us run with endurance the race that is set out before us. So, so what it doesn't say is it's a solo thing. It's not a solo thing. It's a together thing, okay? We always say we're better together. This is included in that thought. This is inclu included in the culture of our church and understanding that we need one another. And the author of, of Hebrews is trying to get to you and get to me that if you're going to persevere, you're not going to do it if you run solo, if you get by yourself, you are going to find yourself in a lot of trouble, okay? So, so first he says, look, we've got this great cloud of witnesses. And he's, of course, referring to those people I mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, these men and women of the faith. And so here's the picture. Uh, it's a pretty amazing picture. If you think about, uh, think about this, Clayton, uh, he is drawing on imagery of a great stadium, the great like Olympic games, the Greek games. And he, he's saying, you, you have a cloud of witnesses. You have, you have men and women of the faith from the past looking down from heaven, cheering you on. So, so you're not alone. Don't go at it alone. Uh, when you're in your room and you're lonely and you're struggling maybe with the depression, what, what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is saying, hey, listen, uh, right now I know you feel alone. You're not alone. God is with you. God's people of the past with you, cheering you on, saying, hey, continue 
do not take off your helmet. Don't walk off the field in this moment. So we've got this great cloud of witness, but we also have each other. And so what we have to do in this season in order to persevere, in order to stay encouraged, in order not to throw in the towel, we have to look around and make sure that we're linked arms with one another. It's why our groups are so important. It's why that we stay connected, even though they're saying uh, practice social distancing. We've got to stay connected as a faith family. So the writer of Hebrews, he's simply showing us that the Christian faith, listen, it's made to last, but it's not made to last alone. We have each other. We need each other. Uh, When I was little, my mom used to always tell me uh, to be careful around the hutch. Now, the hutch in our house was where mom, uh, you know, stored her crystal and her china. And so anytime my brother and sister and I would get rowdy and rambunctious and, 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 and be messing around in the house, she would just say, hey, be careful around the hutch because the contents of the hutch was fragile. Now, now a lot of you think that the Christian faith is fragile. I wonder what your perspective of the Christian faith is. Do you feel like that you got to kind of tiptoe around the Christian? Oh, oh, bad things can't happen or the Christian faith is going to shatter. Oh, I can't mess up or the Christian faith is going to, going, going to shatter. Oh, I don't know the answer to that. I don't understand why God would allow that. Oh, man, i got to be careful that the Christian faith doesn't. Shattered. Do you think that the Christian faith is fragile? This has a lot to do with your perspective of faith. Do you think that Jesus was some a frail, pale, skinny, decaf sipping white boy? I mean, do you think that, that Christianity uh, can only exist in 80 degree weather with bluebird skies and no wind? If you think Christianity is, is, is fragile, you're missing Christianity. Because Christianity, the Christian faith, is made to endure. And if you believe that the Christian faith is fragile because things like COVID-19 um, happen in the world, you're missing, you're missing out on what the Christian faith is really all about. You see, instead of seeing the Christian faith as fragile, we need to see the Christian faith like as a, a tough Northwesterner. I mean, able to stick out uh, through the toughest of winter storms, through, through summer droughts, through fire seasons, uh, surviving, enduring, and thriving no matter what the conditions come. The Christian faith is an enduring faith. It's a preserving faith. It's a persevering faith, okay? But, but if you're going to persevere, you got, you got to have essential relationships. Say be local. Be local. Be local. The Christian faith is about being local and not being a tourist. You see, a lot of us treat Christian faith like a tourist. And what does a tourist do? You, don't, you may not be from North Idaho. Um, we live in a tourist town. So we recognize a tourist from a mile away. And, and here's what we know about tourists. Tourists come and go. And tourists come when only the weather's right. And tourists come, and they only hit the hot spots. I used to be a tourist. I didn't grow up here in the Northwest. I'm a Southern boy, but I'm so glad that I'm planted now in the Northwest. And here's the thing about a tourist. Tourists go home. And so many of us, we treat the Christian faith like a tourist. And we just come to church when it's, you know, when it's good for us. I mean, when the weather's right and things are good, we're like, oh, I'm going to show up to church and I'm just going to make my, my presence known. And, and others are like, oh, man, it's like the time is right. It's Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day. If God, if you're lucky, I'll come Father's Day. I don't know. Like, like we, we've got this tour mind, uh, tourist mindset. But if we're going to persevere in the faith, what do we got to do? We got to be local. We got to put our roots down. You know, I was a tourist, and I used to come and visit with my my brother and sister-in-law. And you know what? They would take us to the tourist hot spots. But my brother-in-law would also take me to the local spots fishing. And there was a season in our life where we shifted from being a tourist to being a local. And being local meant that we had to uproot old relationships and now plan ourselves in new relationships, new beginnings, and that is what God has for you. Some of you struggle in persevering in your faith because you're still living as a tourist. 
You're not planted in the house of God. You don't have these essential relationships that are helping you and spurring you on. So the the writer is just saying, listen, Christianity, being a disciple, it's not about being a a tourist. It looks more like being local. And there's a commitment to being local. So we got essential relationships. Now we got to have also, look at what the writer says. We got to have essential attire. Write that down. Essential attire. Hebrews 12. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So so the imagery he's using here, again, are the games, okay? It's it's the Greek games, and and in these games, he's he's alluding to to a race, and he's saying if you're going to run this race, what these these racers would do is they would strip down, they would would take off what is non-essential and only keep what is essential, Essential, non-essential. See what I did there, right? Essential, non-essential. And we've got to look in times of persevering and go, what is most essential? I mean, that's what is so interesting right now in this season. So many of us are realizing what really is essential. Like it's challenging our faith. It's challenging our relationships. Come on, it's challenging our finances. And we're going, what's essential? Like what do I really need to run this race? And, and the, the author of Hebrews is warning us, hey, there's some things in your life that are weighing you down. If, if you want to persevere, you got to drop that weight. And he says there's some things in your life, he, he talks about sin, sin that so easily entangles us. It gives this picture of, you know, loose clothing that you trip over. And th- there's some old habits, some old sins, some old ways of, of living, maybe that This season is pulling back out of you. And he's like, no, 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 don't do that. you got to strip it away. you got to strip it off. I I think about, I always think about iron men in their race. Uh, These men and women that compete in the iron man. And after the first leg, they come out of the water. And immediately, as they're coming out of the water, they're still waist deep in the water. And they're running to the next leg of the race. They're stripping off their wetsuits, Right? What are they doing? They're not going to go ride a bike or run a marathon with a wetsuit. And I'm just curious, like, are there things in your life that are weighing you down, things that are entangling you? If you're going to persevere, you got to take it off. Come on. you got to strip down to what's most essential. And then finally, he talks about an essential focus. So we got essential relationships. Who's my crew? I'm supported by God. I'm supported by this cloud of witnesses. I've got people in my faith family. I'm not going to be a tourist. What am I going to be? I'm going to be a local. As a local, I'm going to live like a local. I'm going to do what's only essential. I'm going to strip down to those things. But now also, maybe one of the most important things is we've got to have an essential focus. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking at Jesus, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Very descriptive words coming to us here. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the Christ, the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Essential focus. And the writer is using words here, descriptive words that, the English translation doesn't really pick up on. But essentially what he's saying is that when you look to Jesus, it means looking to Jesus and nothing else. It's setting everything else aside. It's a laser focus. It's not, it's not looking over here for love. It's looking here for love. It's not looking over here for satisfaction. It's looking here for satisfaction. It's not looking down here or over there for, you know, um, provision in our life or purpose in our life. It's looking here for provision and purpose. And so here's the reality. Like, I can't look at you and look at him. I've got to fix my eyes. And and this is the picture that uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying. It's like, fix your eyes on Jesus. You see, what you fix your eyes on in time of trial will determine how you come out of the trial. What are your eyes on today? What do you find yourself fixing your eyes on? Listen, look to Jesus, okay? Look on Jesus 
and look into Jesus. Look unto Jesus and look into Jesus. Look at him. Realize, this is what the Hebrew writer is saying. Realize what he's done for you. Look unto him. Realize that he became uh, what he was not for you. Realize that he just didn't wave from heaven and say, I love you. He came to earth to show you he loved you. Realize, look at him and look into him. Look at what he'd endured for you. Look at the pain he went through for you. You see, we can persevere through life because Jesus persevered through death. I love what uh, Isaiah 23 or 26 3 says. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Same picture. Fix your eyes on Jesus. So, so Jesus. Like, Jesus shows us, just practically, he shows us how to finish. It says he's the, he's the author and the perfecter. He's the beginning and the end, okay? It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful word, word picture. Look at it, the founder. What's it mean for him to be the founder of our faith? He's the beginning. He's the starting line. You're not living life until you're living for Jesus. Some of you right now, you feel like you're living life. But unless Jesus is the center of your life and the fix of your focus, you're not living life until you fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the beginning. He is the alpha. He is the one that begun it all. And then he's also what? He is the perfecter. What that means is he's the finisher. So he's the beginning. He's the end. He's the Alpha and He's the Omega. He's the one that set it off and He's the one who finished it. And, and so the author of, of Hebrews is saying, Fix your eyes on the one who's the beginning and the end. And what did Jesus say, suspended from heaven and earth on a cross, before He breathed His last breath and He gave up His spirit? What did He say? When He breathed His last breath, He said, It is is finished paid in full the debt for your sin covered by his blood covered by a life that he laid down looking to jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and here it is listen he's seated and this is significant do not miss this He's seated at the right hand, the throne of God. Did you know that the people of God, when they used to worship God, that they had to bring different animals to sacrifice, to allow the, the priest to sacrifice? There had to be the shedding of a blood for the forgiveness of sin. And so sacrifices went on all the time. And that's why in the tabernacle, there are no chairs, because there's no time for the high priest to have a seat. His work is never finished. But what does Hebrews 12 say? It says Jesus is sitting down. He's sitting down because he was the final sacrifice. He's sitting down because he finished it. He's not just the beginning, he's the end. He finished it for you and for me. And so he sits down, which means we can stand up because he finished it. We've got the power, we've got the strength to persevere. Do not take your helmet off. Don't you give up and don't you give in. I want you to look at how the writer in Hebrews addressing and closing, you guys go ahead and prepare. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Here it is, listen to it. So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Has anyone taken the beating that Jesus has taken? I mean, think about his life. No one. And he endured the cross for you, for me. He finished it for you and for me. And you think, well, that's great. That's Jesus. I'm not Jesus. How am I going to persevere? Well, what about Paul? I want you to consider Paul for a minute. 
Think about Paul. Paul beaten times without number, faced death again and again, beaten with the, the whip of, 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 of the cat of nine tails five times with 39 lashings, beaten with rods three times, shipwrecked three times, left alone 24 hours in the open sea, faced danger in city and streets, the desert, the high seas, among false Christians. He says, I've known drudgery. I've known exhaustion, I've known many sleepless nights, I've known hunger and I've known thirst, I've known fasting, I've known cold and I've known exposure. Apart from external trials, he says, on top of all of that, guess what? I have the daily uh, burden and responsibility to lead God's church. So what he's saying is, listen, I've had hard times. I've wanted to quit. I've wanted to take off the helmet and walk off the field. But listen to me, none of this persuaded Paul to quit. None of this could push Paul off his path and cause him to disqualify himself. Philippians 3, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press towards the call, the goal of the prize for the upper call of God in Christ Jesus, listen, do not grow apathetic in these times. Some of you find yourself already weaning and waning and, and struggling. You find yourself being apathetic. What, what Paul says to you, what the writer of Hebrews says to you, is when you struggle, when you want to give up, focus your gaze, your, your attention, focus on Jesus. It's essential. You've got to have essential Essential focus. The apathy is the virus that brings death to perseverance. And perseverance does not mean perfection. Some of you feel like, Pace, I just, I hear you, but I, I just can't get it right. I keep screwing up. I make promises to God, and then I mess up, and I, I, I'm yelling at my kids all the time, and I'm struggling in this season, Pace. Listen, perseverance doesn't mean perfection. If you could be perfect, you don't need Jesus. Perseverance does not mean perfection, but it does mean keep going. Get your eyes on Jesus today. By way of sealing this word, uh, we want to bless you with a song that we hope encourages you, strengthens your faith. It's a song that has been a banner for my life in hard times, and I hope it will encourage in you. Listen, lean into it, and then I'll close us down in our time together. It's all you've got to just be strong And it's a fight just to keep it together Together I know you think that you are too far gone But hope is never lost Hope is never lost Hold on, don't let go. Yeah. Hold on, don't let go. Just take one step closer. Put one foot in front of the other. You can do this. Just follow the light in the dark. You're going to be okay. I know your heart is heavy from those nights. But just remember that you are a fighter, a fighter. You never know just what tomorrow holds. You're stronger than you know You're stronger than you know Hold on, don't let go Yeah, hold on, don't let go Just take one step closer One foot in front of the other 
today that that you're going to be okay that you're going to make it that we're here for you that we're in this together that you don't have to go through this alone some of you today you need to deal with all three of the things I mentioned in essential business the first is you need to deal with essential relationship, the most important relationship, the beginning of all relationships and understanding how to even love is found in knowing Jesus. You need to establish that today. Essential attire right now without Jesus in your life, you stand uh, condemned and dirty. Your attire is like filthy rags before him. But yet he died on a cross so that you could be clothed in righteousness, essential attire. And then finally, just the essential focus. You're living life and you don't know what purpose is all about. You don't know why God has you here. And today, he wants to take care of all of that. Essential relationship, essential attire, and essential focus by you welcoming him into your heart from some of you coming back to God. And if that's you today, right now, I just want you to click the link that says, I want to commit my life to Jesus. No matter what platform you're on, if you're on oneplacechurch.com platform, hit the raised hand button. But right now, I want to pray for you. I want to lead you through a prayer where you can deal with essential business with God. So many of you need to do this for the very first time. Some of you need to come back to God. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to all pray this prayer with you and add our faith to yours as you pray this, as you say this out loud in your living room to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I need forgiveness for my sin. I want to have essential relationship with you. And I know my sin is in the way. And I believe that you died, you sent Jesus to die on a cross. And he rose again so that I could have freedom. So Jesus, I ask you right now to come into my life. Forgive me for my sins. Change me from the inside out. Change my attire. I give you my heart's focus. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. So many of you making that decision. And again, please let us know. Raise your hand. Wave. Hit the I commit my life to Jesus button. Hit the raised hand button so that we can help you. I told you earlier that those of us who are faith followers, we're meant to be locals and not tourists. That means you, helping you in next steps. We want to help you get planted. So join us. Be a part of this faith family. And we can't know to come alongside of you if you don't go public with the most important decision, the most important relation, the most essential relationship that you will ever, ever have from here and forevermore. Okay? Um, I want to just celebrate those lives. And I know there's going to be a day where we're going to return and we're going to be able to light up our Jesus wall and it's going to be stunning and I can't wait for that moment. It's going to be an amazing time. Those of you that are Christ followers, listen, this message was for you. It's for you. Those of you struggling to persevere, go back, read Hebrews 11, read Hebrews 12, be strengthened in your faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And in that moment, you're going to find yourself strengthened, not from your grit or moxie, but by the faithfulness of God.